Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Josephine Hart Poetry Hour. It's wonderful that you've all come this evening. We're so lucky to have <coughs> lovely Elizabeth McGovern, Lily James, and Freddie Fox reading the poems for us tonight. And um, I feel very privileged that Morris has allowed me to read Josephine's wonderful introductions to the poets. <clears throat> so we'll begin. Keats. Keats, Shelley, Byron, a majestic constellation of genius wiped out within three years of each other. Tonight, we can only give a fleeting glimpse of why death was defeated, for they are immortal. I believe in the holiness of the heart's affections, and it is perhaps because of that belief that John Keats could fashion so much beauty from so much sorrow. His father, owner of the successful livery stables, the Swan and Hoop in Moorgate, died when he was 10. His mother remarried within weeks, catastrophically, then disappeared, forfeiting her rights to her children and to the business and turning her son into such a savage playground fighter that many believed he would make his name all right, but as a soldier. She returned six years later, was nursed lovingly by him, and died from the family curse, TB. That drop of blood is my death warrant, he cried out when his own turn came. It was delivered at a time when he was passionately in love and loved in return by Fanny Braun, a Hampstead belle with many suitors which made him fearful. He was very small and very conscious of it. When Fanny's mother described him as quite the little poet, he raged, one might as well say Napoleon was quite the little soldier. <laughs> Their love was impossible to consummate due to the risk of infecting her. A newly discovered letter paints the agony of this. Haunted beauty, death permeate. La belle dame sans merci. Robert Graves believed her to be the muse and consumption. When I have fears that I may cease to be, is majestic in its despair. On first looking into Chapman's Homer, that wondrous tribute to the power of art was placed by Keats on the desk of his friend from Clark School, Enfield, where he'd received his outstanding classical education. The morning after they both sat till daybreak reading Chapman's translation of Homer, Keats crying out with delight at particular passages, Endymion, a vignette Keats to his friend Stevens, who'd studied medicine with him. A thing of beauty is a constant joy. What think you of that, Stevens? <laughs> it's got a true ring, but it lacks something. Mm -hmm. Later, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. What think you of that, Stevens? It will last forever. Mm -hmm. Keats and his friends had high hopes for Endymion, published in four books in 1818. It was savaged, particularly by the critic Lockhart, of whom more later, who mocked the Cockney poet and the imperturbable <coughs> idiocy that is Endymion. Keats was utterly devastated. Though he would write the great odes in this time and his dramatic experience the wound was deep. He was now seriously ill, and his friends were desperate for him to escape another English winter. He sailed for Italy in September 1821 and died in Rome, aged 25. His gravestone there reads, this grave contains all that was mortal of a young English poet who on his deathbed in the bitterness of his heart, at the malicious power of his enemies, 
desired these words to be engraved on his tombstone. Here lies one whose name was writ in water. In this, John Keats was absolutely wrong. He is an immortal. So now on to, on first looking into Chapman's Homer. On first looking into Chapman's Homer. Much have I traveled in the realms of gold and many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many western islands have I been, which bards in fealty to Apollo hold. Oft of one wide expanse had I been told that deep-browed Homer ruled as his domain. Yet did I never breathe its pure serene till I heard Chapman speak out loud and bold. Then felt I like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken, or like stout Cortes when with eagle eyes he stared at the Pacific and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak in Darien. La Belle Dame sans merci. Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, alone and palely loitering? The sedge has withered from the lake, and no birds sing. Oh, what can ail thee, knight at arms, so haggard and so woe begone? The squirrel's granary is full, and the harvest's done. I see a lily on thy brow with anguished, moist, and fevered dew, and on thy cheeks a fading rose fast withereth too. I met a lady in the meads, full beautiful of fairy's child. Her hair was long, her foot was light, and her eyes were wild. I made a garland of her head, and bracelets too, and fragrant zone, and she looked at me, as she did love and made sweet moan. I set her on my pacing steed, and nothing else saw all day long. For sidelong would she bend and sing a fairy song. And she found me roots of relish sweet and honey wild and manna dew. And sure in language strange she said, I love thee, Drew. She took me to her elfin grot, and there she wept and sighed full sore, and there I shut her wild, wild eyes with kisses four. And there she lulled me asleep, and there I dreamed, ah, woe betide. The latest dream I ever dreamt on the cold hillside. I saw pale kings and princes too, pale warriors, death pale were they all. They cried, la belle dame sans merci, thee hath in thrall. I saw their starved lips in the gloam with horrid warning gaping wide, and I awoke and found me here on the cold hill's side, and this is why I sojourn here alone and palely loitering, though the sedge is withered from the lake and no birds sing. When I have fears that I may cease to be. When I have fears that I may cease to be, before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain, before high piled books in charactery hold like rich garners the full ripened grain, when I behold upon the night's starred face huge cloudy symbols of a high romance, and think that I may never live to trace their shadows with the magic hand of chance. And when I feel, fair creature of an hour, that I shall never look upon thee more, never have relish in the fairy power of unreflecting love, then on the shore of the wide world I stand alone and think, till love and fame to nothingness do sink. 
Endymion. A thing of beauty is a joy forever. Its loveliness increases. It will never pass into nothingness, but still will keep a bower quiet for us and a sleep full of sweet dreams and health and quiet breathing. Therefore, on every morrow are we wreathing a flowery band to bind us to the earth, spite of despondence, of the inhuman dearth of noble natures, of the gloomy days, of all the unhealthy and o'er-darkened ways made for our searching. Yet, in spite of all, some shape of beauty moves away the pall from our dark spirits. Such the sun, the moon, trees old and young sprouting a shady boon for simple sheep. And such are daffodils with the green world they live in, and clear rills that for themselves a cooling covert make against the hot season. The mid-forest break, rich with a sprinkling of fair musk rose blooms. And such too is the grandeur of the dooms we have imagined for the mighty dead. All lovely tales that we have heard or read, an endless fountain of immortal drink pouring unto us from heaven's brink. Nor do we merely feel these essences for one short hour. No, even as the trees that whisper round a temple become soon dear as the temple's self, so does the moon, the passion posy, glories infinite, haunt us till they become a cheering light unto our souls and bound to us so fast that whether they be shine or gloom or cast, they always must be with us or we die. <clears throat> Shelley, I always go on until I'm stopped and I am never stopped. <laughs> Shelley was himself tameless and swift and proud, his stirring line from Ode to the West Wing, Wind. He started as he meant to go on, an incandescent child, sometimes literally attempting to heal his sister's chillblains by means of electrical experiment. <laughs> the family, Cat, a less lucky victim, <laughs> Uh, blowing up his desk at Eton, where he was known as Mad Shelley. Mercilessly bullied, he too became as savage a fighter as Keats. He was sent down from Oxford for writing The Necessity of Atheism, the first public avowal of atheism in England. And to whom did Shelley send his dangerous, indeed potentially treacherous document? Why, to the bishops, of course. <laughs> His father, Sir Timothy Shelley MP for Horsham, was horrified and sent his communications via legal channels and a furious Shelley disinherited himself. <laughs> he found consolation with the Westbrook family and ran away with their daughter Harriet, aged 16, with whom he had two children an advocate of free love in his infamous Queen Mab, he nevertheless wrote that love seemed inclined to stay in prison. Alas, it would escape. He fell madly in love. This time the phrase is forensically accurate with Mary Godwin, also aged 16, the brilliant daughter of William Godwin and Mary Wollstonecraft, author of a vindication of the rights of woman. Some years later, as Mary Shelley, staying with Shelley and Byron in his villa, Diodati, on Lake Geneva, rise to the challenge that they each write a supernatural tale and gift us the Gothic masterpiece, Frankenstein. Throughout his passionate and often tragic life, poor, Harriet drowned herself in the Serpentine, and her family disputed Shelley's rights to his children, who were fostered. Mary and Shelley lost 
two of their three children, Clara aged one and William aged three. Shelley kept on writing, mostly without encouragement from a literary establishment which despised him. Our excerpt from Adonais contains his savage attack on the critic Lockhart and verses that read like a hymn to the dead Keats, numbered now by Shelley with the kings of thought. The Mask of Anarchy, a Miltonian hymn to freedom, was Shelley's inspiring reaction to the shocking Peterloo massacre in 1819, when many unarmed protesters were killed and over 500 injured. The early searing verses, suffused with rage, slowly calm as a mist, a light, an image rose, small at first and weak and frail like the vapour of a veil. Absolute genius. The eternal Ozymandias was written as a result of a challenge after a visit to the British Museum's Egyptian exhibition. Shelley was in the midst of writing The Triumph of Life, the most despairing poem of true eminence in the language, and how Dante would have sounded had he written in English, according to Harold Bloom. Last line, then what is life? Happy those for whom the fold of he put his pen down and joined his boat, the Don Juan, named in honour of Byron. It went down in a storm, the Bay of Lerici, 1822. He was 29 years old. When his body was recovered, a copy of Keats' Hyperion was found in his pocket. He was cremated on the sands and his heart wouldn't burn. And that's the essence of Shelley, buried beside Keats in Rome. His heart was indestructible. Cor cordium, heart of hearts, reads his gravestone, probably literature's most truthful epitaph. Um. Adonais. Our Adonais has drunk poison, oh. What death and viperous murderer could crown life's early cup with such a draught of woe? The nameless worm would now itself disown. It felt, yet could escape the magic tone whose prelude held all envy, hate and wrong. But what was howling in one breast alone, silent with expectation of the song, whose master's hand is cold, whose silver lyre unstrung? Live thou, whose infamy is not thy fame, live. Fear no heavier chastisement from me, thou noteless blot on a remembered name. But be thyself, and know thyself to be. And ever at thy season be thou free to spill the venom when thy fangs o'erflow. Remorse and self-contempt shall cling to thee. Hot shame shall burn upon thy secret brow, and like a beaten hound tremble thou shalt as now. He is made one with nature. There is heard his voice in all her music, from the moan of thunder to the song of night's sweet bird. He is a presence to be felt and known in darkness and in light, from herb and stone, spreading itself where'er that power may move which has withdrawn his being to its own, which wields the world with never wearied love, sustains it from beneath and kindles it above. He is a portion of the loveliness which once he made more lovely. He doth bear his part, while the one spirit's plastic stress sweeps through the dull, dense world, compelling there all new successions to the forms they wear, torturing the unwilling dross that checks its flight to its own likeness, as each mass may bear 
and bursting in its beauty and its might from trees and breasts and men into the heaven's light. Or go to Rome, which in the sepulchre, oh, not of him, but of our joy, tis naught that ages, empires and religions there lie buried in the ravage they have wrought. For such as he can lend, they borrow, not glory from those who made the world their prey, and he is gathered to the kings of thought who waged contention with their first time's decay, and of the past are all that cannot pass away. The Mask of Anarchy. As I lay asleep in Italy, there came a voice from o'er the sea, and with great power it forth led me to walk in the visions of poesy. I met murder on the way. He had a mask like Castlereagh. Very smooth he looked, yet grim. Seven bloodhounds followed him. All were fat, and well they might be in admirable plight, for one by one and two by two he tossed them human hearts to chew, which from his wide cloak he drew. Next came fraud, and he had on, like Eldon, an ermine gown. His big tears, for he wept well, turned to millstones as they fell. And the little children who round his fleet feet played to and fro, thinking every tear a gem, had their brains knocked out by them. Clothed with the Bible as with light, and the shadows of the night, like Sidmouth, next hypocrisy on a crocodile rode by. <laughs> In this ghastly masquerade, all disguised even to the eyes, like bishops, lawyers, peers, or spies. Last came anarchy. He rode on a white horse splashed with blood. He was pale even to the lips, like death in the apocalypse. And he wore a kingly crown, and on, in his grasp a scepter shone, and on his brow this mask I saw. I am God, and king, and law. With a pace, stately and fast, over English land he passed, trampling to a mire of blood the adoring multitude. And a mighty troop around with their trampling shook the ground, waving each a bloody sword for the service of their lord. And with glorious triumph they rode through England proud and gay, drunk as with intoxication of the wine of desolation. O'er fields and towns from sea to sea, past the pageant swift and free, tearing up and trampling down till they came to London town. And each dweller, panic-stricken, felt his heart with terror sicken, hearing the tempestuous cry of the triumph of anarchy. For with pomp to meet him came, clothed in arms like blood and flame, the hired murderers who did sing, thou art God and law and king. We have waited, weak and lone, for thy coming, mighty one. Our purses are empty, our swords are cold. Give us glory and blood and gold. Lawyers and priests, a motley crowd, to the earth their pale brows bowed, like a bad prayer, not over loud, whispering, Thou art law and God. They all cried with one accord, Thou art king and God and Lord. Anarchy, to thee we bow, be thy name made holy now. And anarchy, the skeleton, bowed and grinned to every one, as well as if his education had cost ten millions to the nation. For he knew the palaces of our kings were nightly his, his the scepter, crown and globe, and the gold in woven robe. Mm. So he sent his slaves before to seize upon the bank and tower, and was proceeding with intent to meet his pensioned parliament, when one fled past, a maniac maid, and her name was Hope, she said, but she looked more like despair, and she cried out in the air, My father, time is weak and grey with waiting for a better day. See how idiot-like he stands, fumbling with his palsied hands. 
He has had child after child, and the dust of death is piled over every one but me. Misery, oh misery! Then she lay down in the street, right before the horse's feet, expecting with a patient eye murder, fraud, and anarchy. When between her and her foes, a mist, a light, an image rose, small at first and weak and frail, like the vapor of the veil, till as clouds grow on the blast, like tower-crowned giants striding fast, and glare with lightnings as they fly, and speak in thunder to the sky, it grew, a shape arrayed in mail, brighter than the viper's scale, and upborne on wings whose grain was as the light of sunny rain. On its helm, seen far away, a planet like the morning's lay, and those plumes it light rained through like a shower of crimson dew. With step as soft as wind it passed o'er the heads of men, so fast that they knew the presence there and looked, but all was empty air. As flowers beneath May's footsteps waken, as stars from night's loose hairs are shaken, as waves arise when loud winds call, thoughts sprung where air that step did fall. And the prostrate multitude looked, and ankle deep in blood, hope, that maiden most serene, was walking with a quiet mien, and anarchy, the ghastly birth lay dead. Earth upon the earth, the horse of death, tameless as wind fled, and with his hooves did grind to dust the murderers thronged behind. A rushing light of clouds and splendor, a sense awakening and yet tender was heard and felt. And at its close, these words of joy and fear arose, as if their own indignant earth, which gave the sons of England birth, had felt their blood upon her brow and shuddering with a mother's throe, had turned every drop of blood by which her face had been bedewed to an accent unwithstood, as if her heart had cried aloud, Men of England, heirs of glory, heroes of unwritten story, nurslings of one mighty mother, hopes of her and one another, rise like lions after slumber in unvanquishable number, Shake your chains to earth like dew, which in sleep had fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few. <clears throat> nice try. <laughs> Ozymandias. <laughs> I met a traveller from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command, tell that it sculpt her well those passions red which yet survive, stamped on those lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Mm -hmm. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. <coughs> Byron. I will cut a sway through the world or perish in the attempt. 
Byron, <coughs> aged 16. <laughs> well, he cut a swathe to the world and perished in the attempt. His death in 1824, aged 36, from fever at Mycelongi in his heroic attempt at the head of his personally financed army to free Greece from Turkish rule through all of Europe into mourning. Macaulay compared him to Napoleon. Bertrand Russell's history of Western philosophy would dedicate an entire chapter to Byron. He would inspire painters, Delacroix, musicians, Berlioz, writers, Pushkin, Nietzsche, Goethe, the Brontes. The poetry and the personality created the Byronic myth. How on earth did all this happen? The world, they say, bows to a committed will, and the boy born with a call over his head and a club foot, which would in time necessitate an iron brace, to Catherine Gordon, the Laird of Gite, and to mad Jack Byron, father of his half-sister Augusta, and from whom he would inherit, aged 10, the Gothic masterpiece Newstead Abbey. Had a formidable will, starving himself into physical beauty to become one of the great seducers of his time, of both men and women. Byron was aware the price for women was higher. Man's love is of man's life a thing apart. It is woman's whole existence. <laughs> he also believed, and was loathed for it, that women were as sexually voracious as men. I'd like to know who's been ravished, he once cried when accused again of promiscuity. I've been more ravished myself than anybody <laughs> since the Trojan War. <laughs> the mocked cripple at Harrow, also a fighter, became a legendary swimmer, swimming the Hellespont in under two hours, and above all the supposed dilettante, who uh, was in fact an obsessive student of the classics, took his natural gifts of fluency and dashed into poetry. With the publication of Child Harrod's Pilgrimage, based on his often dangerous travels in Turkey, Albania and Malta, Byron awoke aged 24 and as he said himself, I found myself famous. <laughs> the verses we have chosen, scathing in their contempt, tell of the price of the vaunting ambition of the madman who has made men mad. Stanthal may have described Byron as the unique object of his own attention. However, he was now the object of adoring fans, including infamously Lady Caroline Lamb, married, who when she first saw him declared him to be mad, bad and dangerous to know and walked away. Alas, not for long. <laughs> her obsession destroyed her. Byron married cool, brilliant mathematician Lady Annabel Milbank, not a marriage made in heaven. Byron declaring on their wedding night, my God, I'm in hell, when he saw the red drapes surrounding the bed. His wife left him within a year, taking their daughter Ada with her amidst rumours of sexual abuse within the marriage, which itself was often a bizarre menage, menage a trois with Augusta, Byron's deeply loved half-sister. Caroline Lamb's accusations of homosexuality against Byron, a serious criminal offence at the time, forced Byron to flee England. Like Shelley, he wrote on his output prodigious. Plays, Manfred, the two Foscari Werner translated by Goethe, an Armenian dictionary, a notoriously difficult language to master, and of course, poetry. 
of Byron's final masterpiece, Don Juan. Eliot said it is full of emotion. The emotion is hatred, hatred of hypocrisy. Byron said of his poem, it may be profligate, but it is not life. Is it not the thing? It certainly is. Our selection tells of the adolescent Juan's slow seduction of Julia, 23, married to Alfonso, alas, 50. And at 50, love for love is rare. So we'll go no more a-roving. Few have written a gentler, sweeter poem about the inevitable. Because of his scandalous past, Byron was refused burial at Westminster Abbey in St Paul's. He was finally entered in the family vault at Newstant Abbey. Ordinary people thronged the streets in tribute as the cortege moved from town to town. He was buried as a nobleman and not as a poet. As he was a peer, many sent their carriages. Many were empty. He knew his country well. To Childs Harold. From Child Harold's Pilgrimage, Canto the Third, excerpts. But quiet to quick bosoms is a hell, and there had been thy bane. There is a fire and motion of the soul which will not dwell in its own narrow being, but aspire beyond the fitting medium of desire, and but once kindled, quenchless evermore, preys upon high adventure, nor can tire of aught but rest, a fever at the core, fatal to him who bears, to all who ever bore. This makes the madmen who have made men mad by their contagion. Conquerors and kings, founders of sects and systems, to whom add sophists, bards, statesmen, all unquiet things which stir too strongly the soul's secret springs and are themselves the fools to whose they fool. Envied, yet how unenviable. What stings are theirs? One breast laid open were a school which would unteach mankind the lust to shine or rule. Their breath is agitation, and their life a storm whereon they ride to sink at last, and yet so nursed and bigoted to strife, that should their days, surviving perils past, melt to calm twilight, they feel overcast with sorrow and supineness, and so die, even as a flame unfed, which runs to waste with its own flickering, or a sword laid by which eats into itself and rusts ingloriously. He who ascends to mountain tops shall find the loftiest peaks most wrapped in clouds and snow. He who, who surpasses or subdues mankind must look down on the hate of those below. Though high above the sun of glory glow and far beneath the earth, the earth and ocean spread, Round him are icy rocks, and loudly blow contending tempests on his naked head, and thus reward the toils which to those summits led. <clears throat> From Don Juan, Canto the First, Don Juan and Julia. Alfonso was the name of Julia's lord, a man well looking for his years, and who was neither much beloved nor yet abhorred. <laughs> they lived together, as most people do, suffering each other's foibles by accord, and not exactly either one or two. <laughs> yet he was jealous, though he did not show it, for jealousy dislikes the world to know it. Joanne she saw, and as a pretty child, caressed him often, 
Such a thing might be quite innocently done and harmless styled when she had 20 years and 13 he. But I'm not so sure I should have smiled when he was 16, Julia 23. <laughs> These few short years make wondrous alterations, particularly amongst sunburnt nations. <laughs> love, then, but love within its proper limits, was Julia's innocent determination in young Don Juan's favour. And to him, its exertion might be useful on occasion, and lighted at too pure a shrine to dim its ethereal luster. With what sweet persuasion he might be taught by love and her together, I really don't know what, nor Julia either. <laughs> her plan she deemed both innocent and feasible, and surely with a stripling of sixteen, not scandal's fangs could fix on much that's seizable, or if they did so, satisfied to mean nothing but what was good, her breast was peaceable. A quiet conscience makes one so serene. <laughs> Christians have burnt each other, quite persuaded that all the apostles would have done as they did. <laughs> and if, in the meantime, her husband died, but heaven forbid that such a thought should cross her brain, <laughs> though in a dream, and then she sighed. <laughs> Never could she survive that common loss, but just suppose that moment should betide. I only say suppose it into nos. This should be entre nous, for Julia thought in French, but then the rhyme would go for naught. <laughs> <laughs> a real husband always is suspicious, but still no less suspects in the wrong place. Jealous of someone who had no such wishes, or pandering blindly to his own disgrace by harboring some dear friend extremely vicious. <laughs> the last indeed's infallibly the case, and when the spouse and friend are gone off wholly, he wonders at their vice and not his folly. <laughs> Thus parents also are at times short-sighted, though watchful as the lynx, they ne'er discover the while the wicked world beholds delighted young hopeful's mistress or Miss Fanny's lover, till some confounded escapade has blighted the plan of twenty years and all is over. And then the mother cries, the father swears, and wonders why the devil he got heirs. <laughs> <laughs> it was upon a day, a summer's day, Summer's indeed a very dangerous season. And so is spring, about the end of May. <laughs> the sun, no doubt, is the prevailing reason. But whatsoever the cause is, one may say, and stand convicted of more truth than treason, that there are months which nature grows more merry in. March has its hairs, and May must have its heroine. She sate, but not alone. I know not well how this same interview had taken place, and even if I knew, I should not tell. People should hold their tongues in any case, no matter how or why the thing befell. But there was she and Juan, face to face. When two such faces are so, twould be wise, but very difficult to shut their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> how Beautiful she looked. Her conscious heart glowed in her cheek, and yet she felt no wrong. Oh, love, how perfect is thy mystic art, strengthening the weak and trampling on the strong. How self-deceitful is the sagest part of mortals whom thy lure hath led along. The precipice she stood on was immense. So was her creed in her own innocence. She thought of her own strength and Juan's youth and of the folly of all prudish fears, victorious virtue and domestic truth. And then of Don Alfonso's 50 years. <laughs> I wish these last had not occurred in sooth, because that number rarely much endears. <laughs> and through all climes, the snowy and the sunny sounds ill in love, whate'er it may in money. 
When people say, I've told you 50 times, they mean to scold and very often do. <laughs> when poets say, I've written 50 rhymes, they, they make you dread that they'll recite them too. <laughs> <laughs> In gangs of 50, thieves commit their crimes. At 50, love for love is rare, tis true. But then no doubt it equally as true is, a good deal may be bought for 50 Louis. <laughs> <laughs> Julia had honour, virtue, truth and love for Don Alfonso. And she only swore by all the vows below to powers above, she never would disgrace the ring she wore, nor leave a wish which wisdom might reprove. And while she pondered this, besides much more, one hand on Juan's carelessly was thrown, quite by mistake, she thought it was her own. <laughs> Unconsciously, she leaned upon the other, which played within the tangles of her hair, and to contend with thought she could not smother, she seemed by the distraction of her air. Twas surely very wrong in Juan's mother to leave together this imprudent pair. She, who for many years had watched her son so, I'm very certain mine would not have done so. <laughs> the, the hand which still held Dewan's, by degrees, gently but palpably, confirmed its grasp, as if it said, detain me if you please. <laughs> Yet there's no doubt she only meant to clasp his fingers with the purest platonic squeeze. <laughs> she would have shrunk as from a toad or asp had she imagined such a thing could rouse a feeling dangerous to a prudent spouse. And Julia sate with Dewan, half embraced and half retiring from the glowing arm which trembled like the bosom and twas where it was placed. Yet still she must have thought there was no harm, or else twere easy to withdraw her waist, and then the situation had its charm, and then God knows what next. I can't go on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost sorry I had begun. <laughs> and Julia's voice was lost, except in size until too late for useful conversation. The tears were gushing from her gentle eyes. I wish indeed they had not had occasion. But who, alas, can love and then be wise? <laughs> not that remorse did not oppose temptation. A little still she strove and much repented and whispering, I will ne'er consent, consented. <laughs> <laughs> So we'll go no more a-roving. So we'll go no more a-roving, so late into the night, though the heart be still as loving and the moon be still as bright. For the sword outwears its sheath, and the soul wears out the breast, and the heart, was, and the heart must pause to breathe, and love itself have rest. Though the night was made for loving, and the day returns too soon, yet we'll go no more a-roving by the light of the moon. <laughs>